about how to move things forward. Um, and we, we, we'd invited four people to speak to that. Um, now we've also got Jim Jerome from Sydney who um, was going to show us something about um, the Bureau of Civil Society. Is that right?
Um, and again, it's, it's not quite like these sort of uh, artworks here in the sense that I think it's very much got integral to the school. This is now in the junior school hall, which I think is slightly displaced in terms of the life of the school. It's used for dance, various activities, it's a lot of space. But around the edge of it are these extraordinary freezes. And who they are and what the governing theme of it was intended to be is a mystery. There is a, a cartouche which much covered up with whitewash, so that the writing is, is indistinct now. And um, they seem to be a theme of, of, of uh, and they're vast, I mean, they are big, they, they occupy whole lands of the south, um, east, and I think the, the, the north walls of this wall. One side is not decorated at all. Um, and seem to possibly date, must be from the 19th century. They seem curiously um, um, anachronistic in a way. I mean, the, the, they depict transport through the ages. There's one huge panel which involves really from walking right the way through to taking sort of hackney carriages. Uh, and there's a quirky humour to them as well. The, the walking figures, the little child at the end, is pulling a sort of moose on wheels, which is curious. And, and there's a sort of deployment of dogs in various stages and various carriages and, and things as well, which suggests a sort of quite a quirky sense of humour. Uh, the theme seems to be mainly transport, and somebody suggested something between that and the Forest Hill Mine that was opening up around the same time. But as I say, they seem curiously um, anachronistic. A lot of the costumes, I'm not an expert in costumes, but they seem quite old fashioned 1917. And equally, the transport, none of it's terribly modern, certainly the quoting of the war. Most of it seems to be um, stopped with, with, with steam trains. But, um, and there's, there's, there's some nabbing, seemingly, some bit of celebration of labor going on, and uh, women on bicycles and women pushing prams as well, which is interesting for a girls' school. Some of the panels are clearly there waiting for, for commemorative writing, but there's none of that's occurred, so you have these panels with the surround. But they're all wonderful, and I've got the world worth trying to have a look at. And Part of it is the mystery, and I'm going to put out a press release next week on the back of this event, but also on behalf of Sydney about, about the about it. I'm just asking if there's any information. Well, thank, thank you very much, Jerome. And uh, what, what I'd like to suggest then, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, perhaps you could use the decorated school blog as well. And if you could put up some photographs. Oh, you know. They're there already. Part of a cultural heritage. 
And I fortunately had that support. I had the support in the fact that I was hired. I was an employee of New York City. I was a public servant. I wasn't coming from the outside as an academic, as an artist. Um, I, was, I was there as a bureaucrat. And I got to learn how to work with bureaucracy. And that was actually my greatest joy, was figuring out how to get around the bureaucracy. Um, and I was able to have a staff and to really cultivate an interest and an awareness of the art in schools. And then, because I was a historian, I could then take my own interest and my training as a scholar and wed that with my practical work as an art administrator. And so I was very much, in, I was really in a very unique position. And ultimately, I realized that to make this, this work meaningful to people and to really preserve it, it really needed to be documented and presented in a way that the general public could also really embrace it. And so I was able to get the support of Mayor Bloomberg and his staff and wrote a book and he wrote the forward for my book. So it really became a city statement and it's a testament to the importance of education but also to public art in New York. And I guess the other thing I wanted to say is that I sort of come at art in schools from the public art perspective, as well as the art history perspective. And maybe it's just not a term that's just familiar to people um, in England, but public art as, as thinking about the built environment um, and school art as part of that, I think needs to be part of, of this discussion. I don't think, I think it's, I think it's a way of sort of expanding the reach and of generating more interest and also of ensuring sort of its its longevity and, and its perseverance. So I think that it's important to think about art in schools, yes, as connected to education, yes, as connected to art history, but it's it's so integral to politics, it's so integral to our notion of public space and civic engagement. Um, and so, and the, and the other thing I, I guess I want to say is I've also thought a lot about conservation and preservation because not only was I in a position to think about the future, what kind of art should we put in new schools, but what do we do about our existing collections? So one of the first things I did was document every single piece of art in the New York City public schools, which took years. I mean, it was really almost a 20 year project. And you know, we had works on paper, we had stained glass windows, and we had murals similar to the ones we saw in Chicago. We had pieces of the Parthenon trees and plaster casts. You know, we had um, an entire range of objects. And so the first was to document these objects. And yes, and then sometimes we, you know, we had to save them, we had to conserve them. And then the next problem was, well then how do you make them relevant to students today? Not all of these objects are what we might call politically correct. What do we do? Do we stick them behind curtains? Do we throw them in the garbage? Do we have students look at them critically and come up with projects and think about them today? And so I, I thought about it in all these ways. So sometimes when we conserve something, I call the project Conservation in Context. It was a New Deal hero that had been damaged because students in the 1960s felt that it was racist. Even though the artist who painted it was actually quite a progressive artist, and he was trying to show the panorama of America. And so he took it to black sharecroppers picking cotton. It wasn't condoning slavery, but in the 1960s, in, in you know, the crucible of the civil rights movement, it was a very inflammatory image. So what do I do? Do I hire a conservator and not address this? No. So we had a conservator. We also created a whole educational program around it and had students work with a contemporary artist to create a mural that was in dialogue with that New Deal mural. And then, you know, then I was able to explain the history and able to decode the imagery and to make it sort of meaningful. And the interesting thing was that students today did not see it in the same inflammatory way that students in the 1960s saw it. So that question arises about conservation. What do we conserve? Why are we conserving it? And is this work still relevant to audiences today? And I think that's something that you have to be really mindful of when you're talking about money. We're commissioned through public dollars. So it's that whole, that whole, you know, if we're going to spend so much time thinking about commissioning art, well, why are we using that same thought in the decommissioning of art? 
And similarly, why aren't we, or are we, using that same sort of thoughtful process in determining how public money should be spent on conservation? When we conserve something, we're saying it's of value. And, and so all of these things you know, have come up for us in this collection. Um, but I do believe that when you are able to really um, create you know, a record in the form of a book or a website or a blog or having this ongoing dialogue, that is obviously the first step toward preservation, but it has to go way beyond that um, into like what these things mean and how are they valuable. Um, and I was always urging the artists I worked with, and I worked with hundreds of contemporary artists, to look at historic art in school buildings and say, you know, this is not a new concept. What did this artist do? How did they solve this problem? What can you learn from this? And so for me, the collection was a resource, not just for me as a historian, but it was also for the architects I was working with. It was also for the artists I was working with. But most importantly, I wanted it to be a resource for children. So, so having a website and, and having a book um, has now made it really a resource for teachers and for students. And so teachers who might not have heard about the New Deal may have a mural in their school and they might say, oh, let me look at the website. Oh, this gives me a little bit of information. Now I understand this is about the evolution you know, of civilization. Oh, not an idea I think about now. And this is how I can explain it to my students. And so education in all of its levels is really, is really so key. So um, I'm just really excited to be here and to be part of this conversation because it is something that I really devoted 20 years of my professional life toward. And um, it fascinates me to see the parallels and the similarities because so much of what I've heard today I've, I've experienced firsthand. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thanks for being with us. Um, the business now uh, engagement with the community and uh, the locality is uh, very pertinent to Ian Grover's role um, because uh, Ian is, um, uh, has wonderful, well, two unique titles, I think. <laughs> Ian is Professor of Urban Education History, I think, uh, at Birmingham, uh, and has done a lot of work academically in that field. Um, but your other probably unique title here is um, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Cultural Engagement, is that right? Uh, and in that role, in fact, before even taking on that role, yeah, Ian has done a lot of work bridging um, between uh, the university and the city in Birmingham and looking at people's history and promoting people's history, working with local libraries and museums and so on. Uh, and so I think you've probably got some suggestions. Thank you, that's very kind of thought. Um, before I make my suggestions, I think I want to just draw attention to the things I've got from today, which is very important. I mean, Pisa, when he started out this morning, said some key words, I think. Celebration, conservation, inspiration, networking, community came on. And then later in the afternoon, I think, the word activism seemed to be coming up. That's very, very important. So I see this day, we talked about the power of visual art on buildings, the power of visual art to mobilise community engagement system is really critical, the power of visual art to promote community conversations. And I've also then, during the day, picked up some wonderful phrases from people, I think, and some good questions. Um, Sylvia talked about reading murals, what constitutes public uh, political education, that's it, quite critical. And, um, I must thank Bruce and Will for launching the laughing and learning. That's my I'm going to use that in Birmingham. Sorry. And it's probably right here, but I've got always on me. I just have a wonderful comment about the importance of the incidental. I think that's well worth us all remembering. I've always been intrigued by our serendipity. And on Wednesday of this just gone, I was in London at Tate Britain for an Arts and Humanities Research Council meeting. And it had to finish quite quickly. And I then went and bought a copy of the arts newspaper. I opened the arts newspaper and the headline was Murals at Risk. I'll just read this quote out from the uh, piece in the uh, newspaper. It is a strange contradiction that the works intended to be an artist's most ambitious statement have been so overlooked in the history of British, British 
20th century art. Murals were not in line with what the public valued in the 20th century. What they looked for was the personal and specific, which, perhaps, which, which was perhaps more difficult to find in large-scale publicly commissioned murals. That was a quote from a curator, Robert Lobster, because at the moment, up until the 9th of March, at the London Fine Art Society, there's an exhibition called British Murals and Decorative Painting, 1920s and 1970s. And I think there's a logic here to making connections. So what I'm going to be talking about is the, the next step. Because they got a book, I think mean, Robin showed the book this morning, I think. Um, they got a book out. They have a conference on the 8th of March, Morley College, which I think is, yes, yeah, which I think is a really, really wonderful thing to, to, to make those connections. And people in the audience want to go to that, but it makes a lot of sense to me. So is it in my agenda about making connections? I want to raise a few suggestions. Um, so there's a joint conference coming up at the end of October between the Arts and Master Research Council who funded this event on their science and heritage strand with another research council, which is the EPRSC. If you never remember what it means, but anyway, it's, it's not Arts and Humanities. And it's talking about science and heritage. And at the meeting I was in on Wednesday, they were talking about this year at the centenary of the 1913 Monuments Act, which was, I think, and uh, Andrew probably recognised, I'm not sure, but it was the first piece of legislation about protecting our heritage. It may be that it's a good place for people from here to try and become involved in October, talking about the importance of protecting a particular form of heritage, which is the mural. Um, I also think another link that can be made is there's a big I'm not sure how big another conference coming up in June of this year, where there's an Australian um, school design research conference taking place. And the people who are, who are running the conference in the King's College previously were <coughs> on community in Australia, and they celebrated and did lots of documentation of the 1960s and 1970s community art programs about the use of murals. So again, there's another connection I think we can make in Australia set of academics talking about um, murals. This kind of leads me in then to what's in the future coming, which is that the, um, again, the Archimedes Research Council are leading on a new European funding stream called European Cultural Heritage, and the call for that will be coming out for projects later this year. But the key one, it seems to me, that the, the team should be thinking about is Care for the Future. Care for the Future is a new program. Um, I sit on the, on, on the working group for that and later this year they'll be calling out for large grant applications. And by large grant I mean over a million pounds. And they'll be funding a very small number of these. And it seems to me one of the things that the group should be thinking about is upscaling what you've got. Making more of the international connections you've got already. Expanding those as a central part of the agenda for we'll care for the future. And maybe looking at some other projects are going on that have my synergies with your own in terms of making a much bigger project it takes forward what I think is a tremendous initial scoping and mapping of what is out there as an important, I think, under recognised and under researched area of research. So, it's a nice question. There's some, you know, clearly very, very beautiful practical suggestions there and, and resources that, that we can draw on. Um, uh, I'll pass the mic now to Andrew, Andrew Sage. So, um, Andrew uh, wrote a seminal book, which I'm sure a, a lot of you know, on, on post-war school architecture, wonderfully illustrated. I don't know where you got the funding from, but <laughs> it's very nice to have pictures of yours, isn't there? Which um, we've all relied on since. And um, Andrew's career, I think, it has taken you between the community and academia uh, in the sense that you were working with the GLC, the great GLC, as it once uh, was, documenting old buildings, and then moved to Cambridge, where you're professor of architecture. Now you're back with English heritage. Is that right? So, Survey of London, yeah. So, Andrew's got uh, a, a lot of relevance experience. Yeah, I got a bit of thought about that. 
join me. Thank you, Peter. And, and uh, I want to begin by um, thanking Peter and Kathy and Joan and whoever else is responsible for bringing us here. It is just an extraordinary set of paintings, uh, and in a way, it's relevant to what uh, Peter was saying about the past, because I, I, I have been here before, uh, and I don't suppose I got here for Island Palace, so that's pretty difficult then to do all the paintings, but I got here in about 1990, I think, um, which is kind of less than 23 years ago, and I think it was all quite different then. Uh, God, I don't know what the walls are the same, but the light boxes certainly weren't here. But the point I think I want to make, the reason I mention that, is because I can't remember, of course, really, very clearly, very much about it, except I remember being very impressed by these paintings. Um, and I want to be a little bit boring, if I may, about uh, uh, the uh, recording aspect of, of, of the work that's gone on and, and will continue to go on, uh, because uh, that's not well funded. 25 years ago, uh, photographs which were taken did to find their way to that archive and don't do Now, there are all sorts of reasons for this. It's to do with the fact that we all live in the internet age when we, I mean, we wouldn't possibly be here if the fact that blogs were possible uh, and there's this brilliant interchange of digital information. But of course, it's fragile in various ways. And uh, one thing I would actually like to make a plea for. Uh, in a kind of, in my, my call the housekeeping aspect of this property, is for there, there to be a very clear central archiving of the, the visual imagery which um, has come up as a result of this project. Because all these sites, and blogs tend to fall away after a bit, whatever we can say, uh, uh, the systems change, then there needs to be a kind of treasure chest somewhere. Uh, maybe not with a little 5 by 4 transparent system, but something that very interesting that Bruce said uh, at some point towards the end of the conflict, well, I'm of course in my club immediately, of course I can't let, get there to go back, but at least we had a record of it all, at least we could make a proper record of it. And that is so often lacking, uh, and you need to uh, continue to make a record. You need to make a record of how these, these paintings are. That one obviously is in quite a bad condition, it needs attention. God knows what we're like in 15 years' time. So uh, recording is enormous. Thing, and what you do with the record. It's rather easy to go on without actually doing the housekeeping and clearing up. It's a very boring remark, but I'm going to make it. Um, and as for the future, um, we've heard that I've just been talking to the Indians here, other people about murals. Um, um, I think there's a very natural uh, emphasis put upon on murals and on paintings. But the sculpture, the mosaics, which you talked about, the Dorothy Allen stuff, the non figurative stuff, um, uh, is, is, of course, just as valuable, uh, often more, even more, um, uh, than that possibly destroyed by the uh, record, because uh, it's not all the painting, but some of the paintings are still there, even though covered by a level of whitewash. When the sculptures, when the glass is down on the ground, God knows what's going to happen. And a lot of that kind of stuff disappears. And even more, a little bit of mosaic work which ran back by fountains and things of that kind. Uh, and all that, I think, if you're going to um, continue uh, in some way, it needs to be kind of in there. Of course, because I come from the art world of architecture more than that of uh, the, uh, the decorative world of fine arts. I mean, it's all that we thought of as one, hasn't it, really, ultimately? The colours that are on the wall, the colour schemes, uh, which uh, were in the schools of the art from the county council, and why the colours are in particular places, uh, that's quite important. Now, you may not be able to get back at Temple with the original colours, as they were, because kids are now um, uh, exposed to bright colours of packaging on television and everywhere the whole time, so it works in the night of pictures, it's a different world. But nevertheless, it is part of that picture, it's part of the art of the school, uh, the colourfulness of the original colours and so forth. So uh, that needs to be recorded, even if it can't be maintained. As, as for where you should go, I mean, for, for a start, you think the show, there's a hell of a lot of stuff which you haven't yet discovered or you haven't been recorded. Quite a lot of things on that print, so what we don't really know if it's there anymore. School appears to have gone, what's happened to Brock? Who knows? Uh, that's what we're going to do. I would actually say that you could probably slightly, without going into the whole world of technical parts and in, in, in anything, I mean, none of us are tempting on for it, was there another way, but okay, it's a slightly different one. I think you could push yourselves up, at least I'm now talking about the British area, to, to the college area, where there's a hell of a lot of work. Uh, and at university, there's a little bit bigger than but technical colleges are not all. Uh, in, in the Bachelor College, it was about these vocational colleges. Uh, and I, I think you pretty much restricted yourself to primary and secondary schools, didn't you? Am I right, Cathy? You didn't do much on colleges. So if there's, if, if there's a bit more nursery, okay. If there's a bit more cash from somewhere, uh, your old age, I'll see what it is. I think that there are 
that nature, so they could really do investigation as well. But congratulations to Wimbledon for being such fun. And so varied across the constituents. This was to be so marvelous. Thank you very much. And uh, that brings us back to Sylvia and so our second transatlantic perspective. Perhaps Sylvia, having told us about Chicago, maybe you could give us some reflections on what we were to be doing. You already heard me speak quite a lot today, so I don't want to take up much time here. But again, thank you to everyone for being here. And I think, like many of the people on this panel in this room, when I started working on school art, I felt very isolated. There weren't many art historians who were dealing with this subject, or architectural historians, and, and even within my department of art history, it's very much looked down upon the study of the art in schools in Chicago. So to have conferences like this really is a breath of fresh air for me. And it's, uh, I really to be able to talk to human spirits about this, and I really enjoy that, so thank you. And I think that is one of the things that we need to look to to the future, is continuing these dialogues and continuing the symposia and so forth. And I'm going to reiterate some of the points that have been said already. Documentation, it is important points, not the sexiest of the points, but it is the most important to start with really getting that database, but also encouraging more research. We've heard young scholars starting to talk about research, and I think that that is really key to open that up to people working in different parts of the world and different aspects of these school collections to continue that process. For me, I am most interested actually in uh, two things. When I was researching, one thing that was left out of most of my research were the voices of the actual students from the 1930s or the 20s or earlier, because they'd been lost over the years. I didn't know what the experience had been for them when they were, you know, I tried to find alums, but I didn't find any who had experienced the Mill and Mural, who were part of that time period. When I heard Julia speak today, I really started to think about that embodied visuality of the arts and schools. These, for murals in particular, they quite literally shaped the space, the physical space, but they also shaped ideological space and the, the movement, the growing up within that space. So since we can't go back and get the voices, I think it's also important to start asking the kids today who are experiencing the art forms now, what is your experience, to document that as well. And as well, document the artist's experience. We heard from Bruce Willow today. It's a particular commission to work with schools, to work with school um, departments or boards of education. And what does that allow an artist to do that he or she may not be able to do in another venue? How does this open up that different uh, space for artistic production, and how do they approach this differently? So what are the voices of artists? Why does artists choose to work in a school right now or take that commission? And we have a vast repertoire in New York still going on, started by Michelle, to ask this very specific question. How is that experience in a school different than any place else? So for me, a contemporary perspective, of course, from an art point of view, too, I'd love to see more commissions. More, uh, more money and more commission to build. That may be outside the purview of this network, but it's something that once you bring awareness through documentation, through publications, through exhibitions, one of the things that we did in Chicago that I found most successful, apart from the curriculum, so we actually had an exhibition of the school murals at the Art Institute of Chicago. Many were on campus and applied to the walk and had been transported from schools into the museum. Not ideal, because you want to see them in the schools, However, once they were put into the halls of the Art Institute of Chicago, somehow they were raised to another level. And people became interested in the schools, and they wanted to go to the schools, and then the attention was brought to them. Then the Board of Education wanted to be a part of this. Um, that was not the case until they got that stamp of approval from an entity such as the Art Institute of Chicago. Exhibitions, wherever they may be, bring attention and bring public awareness, and I think that is key to the process. Um, well, thanks uh, to the panel because uh, you know we've had you know, lots of very thought-provoking suggestions there, and I suspect that there may be some further comments or, or questions from the floor. I think probably, Kathy, we've got sort of ten minutes or so uh, if, if we think about a, a three-thirty close. Um, so. We encourage you all to block, <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, you know where the uh, the website is, and I think you just have to 
send emails to Kathy in order to get the rights to put a bog on there. Is that right? Actually, you can find the dog, um, you can find the comment
Bring back 